right on people are people are coming in yeah hello hello everybody gonna give it uh give it 60 seconds for all the all the attendees to trickle in looks like a bunch of people jumping in this is great you're you're very optimistic Stephen. that <laughs> everyone who is scheduled to be here will magically flood in in the next 60 seconds of course of course you could give it a little bit longer too it's a really long 60 seconds time kind of stretches out in webinars yeah it looks like we got a few familiar faces already jose lucy matt candace great yeah we'll we'll uh we'll give people another minute or two we'll see we'll see how many seconds we give them to get in but as people are jumping in just do a quick tech check um if we could have people post where they're connecting in from just name i'm coming in from zimbabwe or antarctica just give us a quick shout out so we can see where uh, where we're having representation today yeah local people here in here in canada bc auckland new zealand a couple of new zealand wow hey, amazing everybody. so at six or seven in the morning there Somebody joining us from Little Canada in Minnesota. Love that. <laughs> Ontario, Washington. Hello, Scott, Chris, Edmonton. Some more Canadians. Ontario. Eight o'clock. Okay, New Zealand is, isn't quite as early, but we appreciate the sacrifice anyway. Thanks for starting your day with us. Nobody yet, Stephen, from Zimbabwe? No, I figured I'd throw that one out there. Antarctica. That'll be that'll be the success when we start penetrating the Zimbabwe market. We'll really have reached global appeal. Perfect. Hi, Jose. Great. Well, uh, we'll just do, do a little bit of housekeeping as people are, are coming in. Just wanted to say thanks, everybody, for joining us um, on the first of two webinars, as you can see on the screen there. Um, today is part one, uh, the foundation for growth, which is strong teams. Uh, we'll get into that in just uh, just a couple of minutes here. Um, for those who don't know me, I know I recognize some of those names, but for those who don't know me, I'm Steven. I am the sales and customer success manager here with the top left team. Um, so if you are a client or you've had a demo, you've probably seen me at some point or at least had an email with me. Uh, and if not, I'd be happy to uh, chat after the after the webinar, I give some contact details. But um, yeah, as we move towards today's topic, which is what you're all here for, and you're not looking to hear too much from me, you're looking to hear from our our focused speaker. Just a quick note, we, we talk a lot in top left and in our in our group of companies, the, the MSP branch, about people and process and tools. Um, I just wanna make it clear that tools are great and, and certainly we sell a tool and we'd love to talk to you about that, but um, certainly the people and process side de deserves a lot of focus. And we'd like to provide some more webinars like what you're about to see today around those kinds of topics. So um, yeah, pay attention, see, see what kinds of things uh, are engaging to you guys, what kinds of subjects would be helpful. Um, we'd be glad to hear it, but this is um, our attempt to head out a little bit more into the, the people and process space, uh, talking about strong teams and perfect flow, uh, which we're very passionate about. So um, yeah, and do stick around to the end. We'll have a special deal related to top left uh, for new and existing customers. So uh, we'll, we'll post that towards the end of the, of the webinar. Um, another thing is that you, if you guys have questions along the way, definitely use the chat, the Q&A features down at the bottom. Um, I'll be monitoring those as we go through our talk and we'll have a couple of Q&A blocks as we go through. So if you hear something that's interesting or you want to dive a bit deeper, uh, I know our speaker is very, uh, very excited about engaging with the community. So please drop those, uh, drop those comments in. And without further ado, I guess I will introduce him and hand it over. So. Uh, yeah, so Stephen Passasil, our, our speaker today. So for over 20 years, Steve has been in industries of um, yeah, the business of building and leading teams in many different contexts and industries. So he's held leadership roles in universities, um, nonprofit and for-profit businesses. Uh, and we've been uh, very grateful for the last four years at uh, the KTI group of companies and top left. He's held several different roles here and uh, most recently as head of coaching, culture and talent development. And uh, he is here to speak today about strong teams and the foundation for growth. So Stephen, I'll, I'll hand things over to you. And if people can refer to him as Stephen, we'll just assume that I'm, I'm the background character, but he'll be Stephen today. 
Thank you, Stephen. Um, you can be the main Stephen. Um, <laughs> I'll just be the guy that's just your guest today. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. And Stephen, thanks for that that setup and, and giving that background. So as Stephen mentioned, I've, I've been a kind of a tangential part of the top left team for the last four years. Um, this, this has been a, a work of passion for Wim Kirkhoff, our CEO, and Matt Fox and his team have been working really hard to deliver the product that hopefully all of you on this call have been enjoying uh, for the last number of years. And, and one of the key things that Stephen mentioned is the, the passion that we have to move beyond the tool um, that, that you plug in to ConnectWise and use to manage your workflow and, and make things that you do more visible toward this idea of really a key part of our work is, is the people that are involved in our work. Um, and the strength of our teams uh, really does indicate how well our work flows. And so we wanted to start to engage uh, with you, our amazing community around those topics. Um, we, we really are grateful that you're here and we're grateful for that, the fact that you've engaged in other webinars that, that the team has led about the product itself. But we really think this is important stuff, um, and we are just thrilled that you're joining us on this journey. And so uh, a question that we think about around here quite often is uh, the question of, of the, it's this, how do we complete more work? It's kind of a, a driving theme for us. And notice the, the question is very specifically worded. Um, we, we didn't say, uh, we don't ask the question, how do we do more work? Um, if you're like us, you probably have no shortage of it. Uh, doing more work is, is not the problem, uh, because, but that is a very different question. But um, it's, it's really how do we complete more work so that we can keep that work flowing through our pipeline. I have a picture here on, uh, that you see on the screen. It's very familiar to most of you, if not all of you. It's the, the image of Sisyphus. I mean, that's probably not him. He's wearing a three-piece suit, so it's probably staged in some way. But he's, he's pushing the rock up the hill, and, and the story is, you all know this, it's kind of the, the endless struggle. Um, you know, the work is never done. It's the image of just struggle and pain um, as he's trying to just keep this rock from landing on top of him. But I, I've always looked at this, and I've kind of smiled, and, and the cynical part of me just thinks of Sisyphus as a bit of an idiot, because here he's got this, this crazy task ahead of him, and he's the only one doing it. So... Uh, if Sisyphus was not the idiot that he is, he would probably stop and look and say to his neighbors, his friends, his colleagues, hey, this is an unmanageable task by myself. Can I have some help? And I wonder if we wouldn't enjoy the metaphor of Sisyphus today if he would have just asked for help and got a team of people to help him push that rock um, up the hill. So this is, uh, this is the first uh, of a two-part webinar, as Stephen mentioned. And we wanted to offer this because uh, there's a theme that keeps re-emerging as we go about our work, um, and maybe you experience this same theme. And there's something that we're all after uh, in our work that we just call perfect flow, uh, where everything's working together well, everyone's on the same page, people know their roles, work is getting completed on time, clients are happy. Now, obviously, perfect flow is what we'll talk about next Wednesday. Uh, so please come back and, and hear some of our thoughts on that. But today we'll talk about one of the main ingredients, if not the main ingredient uh, in perfect flow, and that is the importance of strong teams. Uh, as you probably know, and hopefully you'll agree, there's an overwhelming amount of information out there about how organization design uh, structure and systems are really important. Uh, but it's all about people and teams is what they say, and they're right. But getting the most out of people and teams is still a bit elusive. And it's elusive because it's, it's really hard. It, it's not easy to choose people and organize people in a team and manage teams and, and develop people in the context of a team. It's, it's hard work. So as we keep diving into this topic, uh, I want to just kind of interrupt my flow and get some feedback from, from those of you who have joined the call. And so I want to ask this question, and, and don't if, if you're muted, you can stay muted, uh, but just throw your answer uh, in the chat, and 
Stephen will kind of keep an eye on your answer and, and shout out some themes or, or some outliers and that type of thing. But I'm really curious how many people uh, currently are on the team that you're a part of or the team that you lead? Not, not how many people are in your company, but how many people uh, are on the teams that you're a part of or that you lead? Just throw those answers into the chat real quick. And then Stephen, when you start seeing them, just shout them out. Yeah, got some, some big and small numbers. We got 20, a lot of five, six, seven, a 10 in there. Yeah, lots of lots of sixes and sevens. Okay. Okay. So yeah, yeah, a bit of a variety. Not surprising. And the reason I asked that question is just knowing those numbers will kind of help me to frame how I make some of the comments or some of the statements. Uh, because obviously. Uh, a team of six has a completely different dynamic than a team of 20 or 25 or even more. Um, so there are unique challenges with, with those different numbers, but I appreciate your feedback um, on that. And so, like I said, I'll hope to structure some of my stuff uh, based on that information. But I wanna just let you know, here's what this webinar is not gonna be. Um, this is not gonna be about the structure of teams. Um, so if I presented uh, the various different models of structures and roles of project teams, differentiated teams or, or pods or how to really structure remote teams well, you, you probably maybe yawn a little bit and, and say something like been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And, and, and so I, I'm not going to address those things, although those things are important. Uh, but what I want to address in the next 40 minutes or so is around this idea that it's easy to get tripped up when those structures get interfered with by the people that make them up. And, and maybe, maybe you're nodding and, and maybe you're still kind of like, you know, what is this gonna be about? But um, it's one thing to be able to sit down and make an org chart and understand the different roles that you need to get your work done. But it's another thing to deal with the dynamics of the different personalities and people that fill in those boxes. Um, it's, a, it's a whole other uh, ball game. Instead of talking about structure of teams, what I wanna do is to provide some things that I believe are important for you to think about and determine as you lead and work as part of a team. So, I'm going to provide uh, a couple of axioms, uh, just some statements uh, to frame our thinking around this stuff. Uh, so these are going to be um, not proverbs in the biblical sense, but more just statements that hopefully will present themes to you that we believe are important for you to think about as you're building and leading your teams. Um, I'm going to provide some statements um, around how we want to encourage you to think about people as you build and, and lead your teams. And then we're gonna talk about um, how we believe it's important for you to think about yourself as, as the leader. Um, how do you approach selecting someone for your team? Uh, how do you approach developing someone who might be a little less experienced than someone else? How do you, on the flip side, approach someone who is more experienced um, and you know the, the potential problems that can come in uh, with that? Um, so. Remember, uh, don't hesitate, as Stephen mentioned, if you have questions or comments from your experience along the way, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. I've got a ton of stuff that I wanna throw at you, but um, I'm super flexible, so don't hesitate to interrupt and, and we can camp on an issue that maybe stands out because if it stands out to one of you, chances are it's important to more than one. Um, so uh, let's, let's get some good uh, dialogue uh, going. So there are probably some things that immediately come to mind when you hear the words strong teams. Um, and I'm just gonna throw a couple of them up here and, and again, throw, throw some things in the chat if there are some other things that, that you think about when you think of strong teams. But one of them might be that success has been hard won. Um, and here's what I mean by that. Uh, you have a team of people that is doing some really good things. It shows in your metrics and all that type of stuff. Usually success is success because your team has been struggling along the way and not struggling in terms of conflict, but you know, getting things done 
And having good flow of work, I mean, it's hard. And so very rarely do you hear stories, do I hear stories of, yeah, they just kind of coasted to where they are now. Um, there's usually some, some hard work that's been assigned to, to a successful, strong team. You, you usually have people on strong teams that have this innate compulsion to excel. Very rarely do you have people on your team, and, and maybe you shouldn't if you do, that just kind of sit there and just kind of want to coast through the day. They're not really worried about overachieving. Um, they just kind of want to do the minimum. That is very rarely found on a strong team. Uh, there's no, there are no egos on strong teams. Um, very rarely do you have people that think of themselves more highly than they ought to. Um, and the problems that occur because of that, uh, you probably experience some of that on your own teams. But there's generally this sense of, you know, we're in this together and I'm here to learn. I want to make those around me better. Um, that's indicative of people who are part of a strong team. Um, there's power of, uh, in group trust and loyalty uh, to people on the team, loyalty to the company and to the mission and the vision and what it's all about. Um, very rarely will you be able to say to me that um, we have a strong team, uh, but nobody trusts anybody. I mean, those two things don't usually go hand in hand. Um, and you usually have also people who are, they've been there for a while. Um, they've wanted to stick around because they believe in what's going on. And then there's usually uh, patience. Um, and patience not only with themselves, but with their teammates, um, with the process, uh, patience with uh, changes that are constant uh, in the organization. And so these are probably these, these uh, five things that I've just listed here randomly. They're probably not a surprise to you. Um, you read about them in books, uh, you hear about them on other webinars, on YouTube videos. Um, and these are things that we commonly associate with successful or strong teams. But that's still not overly helpful to me because we haven't addressed the problems that tend to arise when we're dealing with a team of people. So for example, like what if you have a team full of egos? Um, what, if you, what if you have a team that isn't very trustworthy? Um, what do you do in those types of situations? So I wanna throw this quote up on the screen here. And um, I, I'd, I'd love to maybe spend five or 10 minutes getting your thoughts on it, but we won't have time to do that today. But the, the quote is this, and um, we'll, we'll have, uh, we're recording this, uh, right, Stephen and, and Deanna. And so at some point we'll make this available so you can go back and refer to the slides or we might even send people the deck. I, I don't know, I'm just randomly talking about ideas. Um, so, but if you wanna write this down or, or just remember this, uh, this is how I sometimes think about teams. A, a team is like having a baby tiger given to you at Christmas. It does a wonderful job of keeping the mice away for about 12 months and then it starts to eat your kids. Um, <laughs> I don't know what picture that creates in you. Um, hopefully it's not too disgusting and disturbing, but really it, it, it provides a, a picture of a team for me because when things are new, if you have a, a new team or if you have the same team and a new project, um, if you invite new people onto the team, there's always gonna be that level of initial excitement and, and anticipation about what is to come. Um, and so the team starts off and it, like the tiger, uh, does a wonderful job of keeping the mice away. The team starts to do its job of, of addressing problems and solving issues and checking things off the list. And maybe after a while, just like the baby tiger, after it's eating mice for about 12 months, what does it do? Well, it starts to grow. Um, and then as it's growing, it doesn't, uh, his hunger is not satiated, and so it looks for the next big meal. And teams really are no different. If we're not careful as leaders of these teams, um, they'll just start to look for problems everywhere. 
And pretty soon as the team continues to grow and you get a bunch of different inputs and different personalities, we have to be able to manage that process or teams can very quickly just get out of hand. We'll talk a bit more about that later, but hopefully that's, hopefully that's a powerful picture for you of uh, at least, well, I'll just say it this way. It's a powerful picture for me of, of the dynamic of, of teams as, as they grow. Okay. So let me get some feedback from you again here, because I want to just maybe give some comparisons here and get your input to illustrate what I mean by that quote. And so again, throw your answers in the chat. There's no right or wrong, but I'm curious as to what people are thinking. Um, and so here, here is the first comparison. Do you typically like to hire uh, younger people? Or do you like to hire older people? Now, I'm not talking about chronological age. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to get into the ageist uh, uh, argument, but I'm talking about inexperienced people versus more experienced people. So fire those things um, in the chat. What, what do you tend to like to do? And again, there's no right or wrong. Um, there's, there's just the way that you have set up your, your hiring plan. And then Stephen, just kind of fire out, fire out some of the things that people are saying. Yeah, I'll keep, I'll keep an eye on that. Looks like a bit of a, a bit of a mix so far. Sort of people, <laughs> people yeah. pulling right down the middle. Yeah, Depends no, no on the doubt. Job. Yeah, dependent. Yeah, no, no doubt. And and because we all in our companies in our teams, we all have different needs, right? And so. Who better than you to kind of know what you need to plug into your team to make it strong and, and to make it successful? Uh, here, here's another uh, thing. Do, do you prefer uh, to, to look at performance of an individual or one's ability to work with a team? So are you, are you just concerned that they do a great job? Uh, their their uh, customers are happy because of the work they do. They're, they're getting stuff done. Um, or is it more important that that person be a good team member, um, that they fit the culture um, and those types of things? Again, no right or wrong. Yeah, it looks like a bit of a, a bit of a mix of things like teamwork and, and able to mesh with the team, fit with the team, a bit of both though. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And then the last one, um, these are kind of similar, but um, are you more concerned with someone's attitude or are you more concerned with someone's expertise in a given area, in a given domain? Uh, because I'm sure as you're putting your answers in the chat, I'm sure you've worked with people or maybe you have people on your teams right now that, wow, they're, they're, they know a lot and they're able to um, insert opinions and solutions into problems and that we can solve immediately. But they're, they're constantly grumpy, they're pessimistic, um, they don't work well with others, you know, so what do you, what do, you do with that? So what, what are some of the answers there, Stephen? Yeah, it looks like everybody's on the same page. Attitude comes number one, experience and skills can be learned. It's basically the, basically yeah. what people, it sounds like people have, <laughs> have been on teams with some of those people who have the expertise and not the attitude before. Oh yeah, the scars, right? Um, but these are, these are things that we probably all think about a lot, but I'm suggesting that we need to be thinking about them more because if we're not constantly asking ourselves these questions as we're looking to build uh, teams of strength, um, we're just going to be hoping and guessing that things work out. Um, and that'll define also how we uh, conduct our hiring process as well. And so keep, keep thinking about those things. Um, okay. So one of the things too, just talking about attitude or expertise, uh, one of the things that we've done uh, with Top Left and in our, our two MSPs that we have is we've kind of baked these questions into our performance review process. And just in the last year, um, we've altered it to include a section on our values, our habits. Uh, so we have four of them. I'm not gonna go over them now, but the point that I'm trying to make is we bake it into our performance review process because we want to communicate to people that it's not just about doing good tech work. It's not just about making clients happy. Um, it's not just about completing work. 
um, it, it is about living our values. It is about living our habits. And so through the performance review process, we give people a rating on that because we do value attitude. Um, we value expertise, but as people in the chat have so um, uh, expertly said, yeah, attitude is, is more important um, a lot of the time and you can train the other stuff. So that's just how we have kind of started to work that out. Okay. Let's move into, um, I mentioned that I was gonna offer a, a couple of axioms here. Um, it's actually gonna be three that uh, now is kind of turning out to be the meat of, of the webinar here. And so hopefully, hopefully what you have gotten so far is that, um, and I mentioned this a little bit at the start, uh, it's not about, here is the, the formula that if everyone just followed this basic formula, everyone would have a strong team. Um, if, if, I, if I said that at the very beginning of, of our time together, I, I would expect that most of you would jump off the call uh, because you would go, well, here's this greasy salesman who thinks that he's gonna just you know, hand us this amazing formula. Um, it, it's not possible. And so that's why I asked the different questions about your context because it really is up to you to define what it is that is a strong team for you. So that's why I'm offering you more statements and axioms. So here's the first one that I want to encourage you to really think about as you think about your own teams and how to make them strong. Teams need to be so in tune with the purpose that they end up, oh, a massive typo, Stephen, that they end up holding themselves accountable. So one of the questions that uh, one of our team leads uh, loves to ask all the time, he asks it of himself and he asks it of his team. And the question that he asks is, what do we care about? And, and I, I love the question. Um, and the reason that I love it is because it's a different question than what's our vision? It's a different question than what's our mission? or even what's our purpose. But it's a very different, more personal way to ask that question when we use the word, what do we, the words, what do we care about? And I'm not gonna ask you to, to fill this in, in in the chat, but it's something for you to think about because I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you all have your statements uh, and your values and your mission and all that type of stuff, but how would you answer the question, what do you care about? My encouragement to you is you have to have an answer to that. Um, and hopefully your answer as the leader to that question lines up from a work standpoint with how the company answers that question. Um, and when those things line up and you're able to articulate that to your team, hopefully they end up caring about the same things too. Because if you're not in tune with what you care about, um, it's going to be very difficult for them to police themselves or to hold themselves accountable. And you're going to end up having to constantly follow them around and, and ask them questions about why things aren't getting done in the way that you as a team agreed they would be done. Um, so what is it that you care about? And what is it that your team members care about? And again, hopefully uh, the answer to those questions are, are the same. The second axiom, if you have a team of superstars, even the best will question their ability. And here, here's, here's what that means. Here's, here's just some, some food for thought about that. Um, we, all, we all enjoy high performers. Uh, we all uh, reward people who do amazing things. Um, we we uh, highlight publicly uh, when things go really well. And so we call those high performers, we call them superstars. Um, but it actually is very dangerous when we have a team full of them. Um, we, we need a balance of people on our teams of the superstars. We need a balance of people who are young and inexperienced and who are learning but who are fiery about learning and have questions that they pose to the team of superstars 
to make sure that no one on the team is, is complacent. And so I don't know what the makeup is of your teams right now. You don't have to share that in the chat, but keep that in mind is that you have a team full of superstars. Even the best of your team are going to question their own ability. Um, because if everyone's performing at a high level, um, who's pushing them? Um, who's asking those questions that they might not be able to see themselves? So think about that. Uh, might interject for just one sec there, Steve. Come on. Yeah, I, I'm sure we're, we're not dealing with, uh, you know, massive enterprise uh, scale like a Google or an Apple or a Microsoft. But in terms of, you know, the, the superstars, we sometimes idolize those kinds of companies that, you know, they're all superstars. If you've got a Google or an Apple or a Microsoft on your resume, you're one of those superstars. So how do you, how do you think it works in, in bigger teams as people grow and they start to attract bigger talent? Yeah, I, I love it, Stephen. Thanks for that. Um, one of the things that is, is really interesting, uh, we, we're in the middle of, of a hiring process across all of our divisions right now. And one of the things that we've noticed over the years, um, and this may not be news to anyone on, on this, on this uh, webinar, but anybody can say anything about their abilities in the hiring process. Um, and the, the people that think of themselves as the superstars, um, maybe they, maybe they aren't. So, so that's, that's the first thing is, uh, not just because someone goes to the big corporation like Microsoft or, or Apple, um, or whatever, Google, um, and gets the big bucks doesn't mean that they're a superstar. That, that's, that's the first thing that I'll say. Um, and. I, I just I just don't think now I've never worked at Apple I've never worked at Microsoft or or Google, but I would hope that even those teams that make up those that organization have a wide range of people from superstar to novice to uh, June like to mid level who are all, who are all offering their different experiences. Um, there's just no other way to to run the team. Um, I, I would maybe be curious to ask the, the group, uh, has anybody ever been a part of a team of superstars and, and how has that gone? Has that been a positive experience or has it been a struggle? I'm going to just maybe take a minute, Stephen, and, and pause and just get some people's feedback on that because it's a great question that you ask. And while, while people are chiming in, and if no one chimes in, that's totally fine. I'll keep blabbing. Um, but the, the other thing to think about too is, uh, I don't know how many of us on, on the webinar are part of a smaller kind of a startup phase company or a small to medium versus the Microsofts and the Googles who are these large established corporations that all you have to do is just do what everyone else does and you'll be successful. Not a lot of room for creativity, not a lot of room for, hey, I have an idea. Um, whereas for smaller companies, like maybe a lot of ours that are much more agile and we're, we're open to having people come in and challenge the status quo and stuff like that. That's another different dynamic because a team full of superstars is not gonna be very open to doing things differently because they're like, hey, I'm a superstar. Uh, why do I need to change? So any, are there any comments in there, Stephen? Yeah, there's a couple just talking about, I mean, certainly people engaging with the idea that too many superstars can end up with ego issues. Thanks, Candice, yeah. for that. And then there's uh, maybe kind of the idea of a, a celebrity superstar. So somebody, somebody names out Elon Musk or some of these, you know, superstar tech figures that uh, maybe are, are too quick to, to tweet things out. But uh, yeah. yeah, the definition of a superstar. Yeah. Thank, thanks for contributing that. And Stephen, again, thanks for asking that question. I, I don't, I hope I addressed it. Um, and yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Love, love the, love the chiming in here. Okay. Uh, Axiom three moving along. Um, did I already talk? Did we get to Axiom three? Just starting it. You're on the right okay, track. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, so the strength of a team is drawn from the bonds of trust and loyalty developed over years. 
wow, that sounded very, um, that sounded very Renaissance. Sort of had like soft music playing in the background while I said that. Drawn from the bonds of trust and loyalty developed over years. Um, one of the things that I think we're all struggling with is this idea of bringing new people onto the team and just hoping that they stay longer than three months. Uh, maybe that's an exaggeration, longer than a year. Um, we've all experienced the pain of onboarding someone, the, the financial and the time cost of that, only to have them um, be trained by us. And then a year later, they're gone. Uh, it's really hard to build a strong team in that environment, is it? And so the longer we can keep our people around, the stronger our teams get because that's where trust is built over time. Loyalty uh, to each other, to the company is, is built. And that is not something that happens in the three month probation period. But the more that we can think about this axiom in how we hire, how we onboard um, is gonna go a long way toward us really cementing the foundation for that strong team over time. Um, it's not something that happens overnight. It takes a lot of work, um, but trust and loyalty are, are so, so important. Yeah, I think I'll add an extra comment there, Steve. Uh, certainly being talking to a lot of MSPs in my role, I know that staff turnover and especially quick turnover in a remote world now that we're in this COVID sort of pandemic, post-pandemic era is a big problem. So maybe if if anybody could post in the chat, if you've lost a, a newer employee in 2021, I imagine yeah. we'll probably see a, a pretty high proportion of that. Yeah. I'll just take a like a 15 second breath here and see if anyone chimes in here because yeah, it, it's, it's huge. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, turnover is the antithesis of strong teams or can be. And I think sometimes it gets the MSP culture can be branded that way. Like I'm going to go work in corporate IT in an internal uh, department rather than a managed services provider. But it do, certainly it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a comment from Candace. Their staff is so difficult to come by. People being poached all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got yeah. another comment uh, just about um, some Sin Simon Sinek stuff about good people leaving bad bosses sometimes, not, sure. not a good company, how that, how that connection is there. Yeah. yeah, onboarded three and two left within the first few months. Sorry to hear that, Angie. Oh, oh, I feel your pain. The scars. Yeah, thanks for those those comments. So we, there are some definite shared experiences here. And so, I've I've given three uh, statements, and now you're probably all going, okay. And well, now what? Um, yeah, we agree with these statements. We've lived them. We've experienced them. And so now, what I want to do. Is, is hopefully give you some things to think about, uh, some, some tools, and, and they're less like actual practical tools, but they're more thought tools to answer the question, so what, or, or what do we do from here? And I wanna, I wanna give some statements or some thoughts about how, how we, how you can approach uh, your people. And then after that, um, I'm gonna wrap up with how you can approach yourself as a leader and some ways that you can maybe think in new ways uh, so that you can uh, foster an environment of, of building a strong team. Okay, so how to think about uh, people. One of the things that we all have to keep our eyes on and nip this in the bud very, very quickly is, is we all know the pain of, of having someone on our team that's an energy suck. Um, and the reality is that if, if you're the sort of person that sucks all the energy out of the group without giving anything back, um, that, that person, one, is, is just not going to get along very well, but they're probably not going to be around very much. And so if you have members of your team that are like that, um, even in kind of uh, not overly stated ways, my, my encouragement to you is make a change sooner than later. And this goes back to some of those comparison things that I, I had you look at earlier, like attitude versus expertise. Even if someone is an amazing technician and they've got all the knowledge in the world and they're super efficient, um, if they're sucking energy from everybody around him or her, you're not getting anywhere. 
Uh, in fact, your, the strength of your team is eroding quite quickly. So you don't want people sucking energy. Uh, what you wanna pay attention to and foster an environment where people are able to just kind of quietly do their job. Um, look for people in the interview process, look for people in, when they're onboarding and training with you. You know, how do they approach their work? Um, are, are they interrupting everyone around them and telling them what they're learning, uh, which is not an overly bad thing? Or are they able to just take an instruction and go and get it done and then come back for more? I hope I'm communicating kind of the, the nuance of, of what I'm talking about here is there's nothing wrong with high energy. There's nothing wrong with conversation and dialogue about what's going on around the learning and performance process. But really, if that's the norm, that can also be a little bit of a drain. Um, just like being an energy suck is a drain, uh, being too high energy uh, can also be hard. And so you want people who are just able to hunker down and, and get work done. Yeah, w one question I missed there just about energy sucking is somebody's yeah. just asking, is that like, can you define that? Is that negativity? What is What exactly is the energy sucker look like? Yeah, um, uh, pessimism, you know, oh, that'll never work. Um, yeah, you know what? We've tried that five times or we, we've been trying that for years now and it, it, it's never worked. So, you know, some, some new person to the team raises his or her hand enthusiastically and says, hey, I've got an idea. Um, no, that'll never work. And pretty soon the shoulders are slumped and everyone's like thinking about the reasons why it won't work as opposed to thinking about the reasons why it might. Um, so yeah, pessimism, you know, just all, you know, the, the dark cloud over the head, um, you know, not a good reason to get out of bed in the morning, um, th those types of things. That, that's, that's what I mean by energy suck. Um, look for people uh, to bring onto the team and, and foster uh, this type of approach, like a fresh approach to things. Um, objectivity. Um, People who question everything. And I, I, I really uh, second guess myself when I typed question everything, because what I don't want to communicate is like question everything in terms of, of at some point, we just got to get work done. So, um, and, I, and I also don't mean question authority in, in a way that is always challenging, but you, you want people that are confident to raise their hand and say, hey, you know what? We've never tried this before. What if we just what if we do this and, and see if this works? Um, you know, objectivity is, is more looking at things like, hey, here's what the data says. Um, you know, lots of people have been, been using this uh, with these results. I, I, think we would, I think we should try it, but for these very specific reasons, as opposed to just kind of guessing. Um, so the, the fresh approach is, is the main point in that, uh, the fresh voice. Uh, no, no bosses. You don't want... You don't want people other than you, the leader, bossing other people around. Um, that does not foster a, a culture of trust and loyalty. Um, it's one thing to have expertise that someone else might not have and move into the role of a mentor to be able to guide other people along. But you don't want a, a culture on your team where people are like, hey, um, I don't have time to do this. So could you please do this? Or... Um, you know what, I'm, I'm so busy right now, I, I can't answer the phones. So someone else needs to do that. You know, that, that might be true, um, but that's a very different statement to make than, hey, you know what, I'm overwhelmed right now and I'd really appreciate, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you wanna make sure that you have a situation where you are the leader, you are the boss, and your team is working together uh, to build those bonds of, of trust and loyalty. Continuing on with the, the people idea, you, you want to have people on your team that are able to learn to deal with situations where they have little to no control. Uh, we, we're all familiar with the idea uh, or the reality, it's not an idea, the reality of unplanned work. Um, that might be very hard for some people to deal with, but if that's our reality working in MSPs, we need to be able to have people that um, are okay with that and, and are able to not just kind of freeze or be paralyzed by the fact that, oh, I had this, 
these three things that I wanted to accomplish today, these three deadlines to meet. Um, but, um, you know, this unplanned stuff has come in and I'm, I'm, I'm really paralyzed as to what to do. You want people who can deal with that. And you want people who take responsibility uh, for their work. Uh, you want people who understand what it is that you've asked them to do and are saying, yep, I understand. I'm going to go do it. And if something goes wrong, they're like, you know what? That's on me. Um, I, I wanted to do this and I thought I did, but I didn't. Or I did this. This went wrong. But they immediately come to you and say, they immediately go to the team and say, yeah, it didn't work out. Uh, I broke that. That's on me. And you want that to happen sooner than later so that you can together then as a team get together and solve that problem and move on. And then you want people who are decisive. And it, it's related to the idea of taking responsibility. You want people who are going to not just sit there and, and for hours and go, wow, I'm, I'm afraid to make this decision because what if I do and something goes bad? Um, there's a difference between being cautious and responsible uh, uh, and uh, being paralyzed uh, into doing nothing. So you want people who are decisive and who are able to make decisions. And everyone starts at the bottom. Now, this is, this is a hot topic for debate. And I, I don't mean that if you have a 20-year uh, veteran coming onto your team, um, that they start at minimum wage and work his or her way up. But what I'm talking about is everyone starts at the bottom in that everyone does the same work at the very beginning of their tenure on your team. And, and the reason that you want to be careful about uh, not over promoting someone too quickly is because you want everyone to know that everyone has done the work of everyone else on the team. Um, it, it's, it's just going to create a lot more trust um, uh, amongst your team knowing that everyone has been in the other person's shoes. So those are just some things that uh, I suggest you think about when you think about the people on your team and how you're building your team to be strong. And I'm, Stephen, you can see me, I'm, I'm leaning to the side here a little bit because I am watching the time here. We're, we're in really good shape, uh, but I am aware uh, and we will end on time uh, for everyone that has a full day um, ahead of them. Okay, so that's how to think about people. Now, how do we think about ourselves uh, in our, our leadership roles? So here are some things that, that um, we need to do as leaders to deal with people, but to also foster the growth of strong teams. Um, we need to do whatever we can to keep egos in check. Now, that doesn't mean that we beat people down for being outspoken, uh, it doesn't mean that we uh, humble people who are like, yeah, wow, let's celebrate this. We did that. That's not what I'm talking about. But I mentioned earlier this idea of um, the, the energy that is drawn away from a team when people think of themselves uh, more highly than they ought to. Um, you want to be really careful with that because the last thing you want is younger people or less experienced people on your teams to just start ignoring people who have more experience because it's all about ego. Um, you want your superstars or you want your more experienced people to be mentors to the more inexperienced people. And you've got to make sure that those egos are in check for that reason. You want to find out what triggers self-confidence in each one of your team members. Um, because everyone is so busy, um, people tend more to be overwhelmed than not. Um, you want to make sure that you are putting people in positions to work out of their strengths so that their self-confidence is constantly triggered. Now, there's a balance there, isn't there? Because there's nothing wrong with challenging people. There's nothing wrong with putting people out of their comfort zone so they can learn new things and be challenged in their own growth. But you want to make sure there's a good balance there. Um, and nothing is more self-motivating to someone than self-confidence. So think about ways that you can trigger that in your people. Um, I, I put metrics with a question mark here because I, I know that for, for most of us, if not all of us in our MSPs, we use metrics to kind of tell us how we're doing in, in our companies and in our teams. 
Um, think about ways that you can use metrics to motivate your people. Um, so you might put out re weekly updated rankings on performance measurables, but be careful with that if you do, because people prefer not to compete against people that they like. And so if you associate a strong team with a group of people that like each other, um, if you start pitting them against one another with metrics, that could be a dangerous thing. Uh, the way to get around that is if you establish a personal relationship with each member of your team, um, you give them a metric and say, hey, you're, you're a little bit uh, behind the next person because here's our collective goal. They're going to take that a lot better than if you're just randomly putting metrics on a screen and then people are just watching how high their uh, line is climbing. So by all means, use metrics, but don't use metrics without establishing that personal relationship with each team member, because they'll take it in the way that you want it to be taken, which is for their own improvement and for the betterment of the team. And then if there's conflict um, between two people on your team, that means that there's conflict um, with everybody, especially for those of us that have smaller teams, um, the whole group is thrown out of whack if, if there's conflict. Now, we're human, and so there's going to be conflict. But as leaders, we have to recognize that and insert ourselves into that and solve that very, very quickly, or it's going to become a whole team problem. So keep, keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about here is... Um, Oh, I had, I had some other things, but just for the sake of time, I am going to race here to the end. And I want to just leave you with um, three indicators of, of strong teams. And so this kind of hopefully kind of pulls things together and, and leaves you with some statements, again, for you to think about and ponder as, as you think about building uh, strong teams where you work. And so when I say indicators, I mean that if someone were to come into your team off the street and they would just kind of witness how they behave and how they interact, they, they would see these things. They would see humility, uh, a swarm of people acting as one. Um, they would see people who check their own self-interest at the door for the sake of the team, for the sake of the greater good. Um, they would see things, there, there's a collective ego as opposed to individual egos. Um, so the challenge for all of us is taking these statements that we've gone over and some of the, the challenges that we face as leaders, how, how do we foster these things um, in our teams? How do we get to a point where um, some of these things are not just ideas, but, but realities? The, the crazy thing about all this stuff I mentioned before is this is a long play. It's not something that happens overnight. And so um, it takes patience uh, for you as the leader, and it takes you fostering patience uh, with everyone on your team to make some of these things um, a reality. Uh, before I turn it back to Stephen, um, I wanna just leave you with several resources that have been helpful to me as I've thought about uh, this stuff, about building teams. Um, and so I encourage you to check these out. Um, the Leadership Moment is a fantastic book uh, by Michael uh, Yusim. Um, it's it's uh, very not like here are the 10 steps, uh, but as much more he takes actual experiences that people have had and basically dissects them to talk about what went on there um, in those teams. So The Leadership Moment, uh, The Go-Giver by uh, Berg and Mann is a book that we actually use uh, with our group. Um, and it's just a thing that is able to help us frame our teamwork around the idea of humility um, and service. And then the last one is uh, the 27 Challenges Managers Face by Bruce Tolgan. Um, and I just, I picked these three out. There are obviously more, and you could probably make some amazing suggestions of resources that you've drawn on over the years. Um, but these are just some of the things that I would encourage you to, uh, to check out. So, I, I've, I've thrown a lot of stuff out there. Um, I, I really trust that it's been useful if, if anything to just spark your thinking 
uh, around um, moving beyond just structuring teams, but looking at more of the, the cultural and leadership implications around uh, what goes into building strong teams. Um, so uh, Stephen, I'll, I'll turn it back to you uh, to, to wrap us up here. Yeah, I appreciate that, Steve. And, and just a quick comment to kind of bring things together. I know that um, me personally starting on the, the team right as soon as we went sort of COVID remote and there was the entire remote transition for our own teams going through the onboarding process, uh, it's been great to get to talk to you and, and the KTI group with just, yeah, a lot of these topics that you're talking about and how we structure the team, how we communicate, where the gaps are in this this weird pandemic life. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just I'll make it one more note that if people are interested in uh, continuing this conversation, certainly you see Twitter and LinkedIn for Steve down in the corner there. Um, but if you want to uh, schedule some something more official or a longer conversation, happy to connect with that, whether you reach out to Steve directly or if you can go through me, I'm happy to, uh, happy to point you in the right direction there. Um, now, th I think we've handled all the Q&A that came through from the chat, but if you do have any last questions, you can maybe drop them there. We might have uh, a minute or two for that. But I think, uh, Steve, you can go towards maybe the, the next, is that the next slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah you So, bet. Yeah, we do want to, um, certainly this isn't all about the tool. We want to make that clear that um, our tool, our, our Kanban boards as top left, for those of you who, who don't know, um, we do provide a tool that um, connects with some of these concepts that we're talking about in terms of not being overwhelmed, how to manage a team's flow of work, how to um, sort of understand this data and manage that without just feeling totally uh, lost in a sea of overdue tickets or projects and clients that are complaining at you. So um, certainly there, there's the people in the process side, but we do want to make an offer for the tool side as well. If For those who are interested, um, we have this completed ticket challenge, which you can see the little graph down in the corner. Yeah, you can click through a couple of those bullet points. Um, it's a boot camp that we've put together to, you know, if your tickets are uh, a huge stack of stalled and unassigned and in-progress work, we want to give you some tools practically in our in our tool, but also some steps and methods that you can put in place to make that not the case, to minimize that pile of overwhelming work. Um, so that's what this completed ticket challenge is. You can click through a couple of bullet points there on the slide, Steve. Yeah, so this gives you um, weekly training. We've got some guides with emails and videos and uh, a weekly community call. So it's a group oriented thing with, with our trainer, Matt Fox, uh, and he connects with other people in that other MSPs that are enrolled in this program to really engage dialogue around some of these issues as well as the features. Um, and we've even had existing, you don't have to be a, you know, if you're an existing client or a brand new client, this is open to all of all of these kinds of people. And uh, one of our long-term uh, customers down in Australia, uh, James at Kodo, he says he wished the completed ticket challenge existed when he first started adopting Kanban. Um, it's certainly the workflow and onboarding you need to get started. Uh, and that's what we want to present as a deal today. So on the next slide here, usually this is um, $199. It's a, a, an onboarding and training program, but also available for existing clients. Uh, we want to offer that if you're, if you're looking to sign up and uh, you can commit to an annual plan, and I can talk to you about specifically what fits your needs as far as pricing and things like that, um, any annual subscription, we're throwing this program in for free. Um, so that's the, the training calls, the uh, email and training resources, and uh, that's included in with Top Left, which is our our Kanban app focusing on the service and project workflows, and you know visualizing your tickets, uh, sort of the uh, the Trello for MSPs in a, in a sense. So, yeah, this is a limited time offer just for people who are attending the webinar, and it's only available till the end of the month. So I know U.S. Thanksgiving is coming up there. We're uh, Going to have a busy last week of the of the uh, month, but if you want to engage, there's a couple of links here. We'll send you a follow up email with this. You don't have to have that all memorized. No worries. That's my pitch. Uh, I didn't see any uh, last questions come in, so I just want to thank everybody for attending. Again, this is the first of two parts. So next week, same time, same day, uh, November seventeenth. Uh, for most of you, I guess Australia and New Zealand, that's the eighteenth. Um, but yeah, the catalyst for growth, perfect flow. We talked more about the team side and we'll transition into the, the flow side next week. So yeah, be there and tell your friends. Thank you very much for, uh, for engaging in the chat. We appreciate that, everyone. Great, thank you, yeah. And I think we are done. <laughs>